Okay, today we are picking up in Exodus chapter 25 is our section that we're going to be working through this morning, and it's going to be a little bit of a shorter message uh, because of the meeting that we'll have afterwards. Um, get these lights real quick. I'm going to do a presentation real quick. I'm going to do this up front, so we're going to turn the lights off again, so bear with me for just a little bit here. Today we're going to get in, we're going to look at the tabernacle, and we're also going to look at the uh, lampstand or the menorah, and uh, this is uh, just a picture, it's a presentation of what the table would have looked like with the show bread. There would have been uh, 12 loaves of bread uh, with the cups and the, uh, that would have been used, and the, the table really would have been a short, we're going to talk about the dimensions of the table, it really wasn't a very large table, it's actually a short table. Uh, it would have had a little edge around it here, and this would have uh, kept items from, from sliding off. Uh, and then, of course, you have the poles that run through here. I thought this was a pretty good, uh, pretty good representation. And then we have the, uh, the lampstand, or what is commonly referred to as the menorah. Um, and here you can see the design of it. And by the way, you know, you, you, when we look through the biblical passage and we read through the scripture in, in Exodus, you're going to say, well, you can see how they came up with this uh, design, but how did they come up with like this uh, stair-step design down here? Where did this come from? You know, how did they come up with, uh, with this particular design here? And of course, it's hard to tell the dimensions from this picture here. I saw some artist renditions, and I, I probably should have included it in this presentation, where some of the uh, uh, artists pictured the, the menorah being eight feet tall with uh, the priests having to come and stand on these platforms to light the, uh, you know, the, the, the lamps at the top. Uh, but really, I think it would have been shorter. I think it would have been three, maybe four feet in height. It would not have been really even taller than a man, I don't think. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, lampstand was used to light the inside of the tabernacle. Uh, there would have been seven lamps in all. We'll look at this. But this design here actually comes from a historical reference point. And that reference point uh, actually occurs on what is called the Arch of Titus, uh, which uh, was built back in 81. And as some of you know, you historians, uh, if you'll read back in the history books, you'll know that Titus, the son of Aspasian, uh, was the Roman general that destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Uh, that the city was destroyed, that the temple was destroyed. Today we see the Wailing Wall. We see that portion uh, that is actually the outer wall that was actually built by Herod the Great. It's not part of the original temple. That was completely destroyed and razed to the ground, uh, burned to the ground, actually. And this, would have, this was done by Titus and his troops, again, in the summer of A.D. Uh, according to history, uh, and this would be taken from mainly from Josephus, who was the historian at this time, Titus laid siege on April 14th in A.D. 70 is when he laid siege to Jerusalem, and he destroyed Jerusalem on August 10th, A.D. 70, and burned the temple. That was the day that that event uh, took place. And according to Josephus, Titus killed 1,100,000 Jews and took 97,000 into captivity. There were some who fled the city who did escape, uh, but these are the numbers that come down to us from the historian Josephus. Uh, during uh, the, the pillaging of the city, uh, the, the, uh, some of the items in the temple at this time were taken by the Roman general Titus, and we'll see this on the arch, on the archway here in just a little bit. Uh, but the two items that, that show up there are the table of showbread, which is what we're going to look at today, and the menorah. And he took these two items back to Rome as spoils of war. It's interesting that nowhere uh, is the Ark of the Covenant uh, ever displayed. Uh, and so it, it poses a big question mark as to you know, if they even had it. Many believe that it was destroyed uh, during the Babylonian uh, destruction when Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. But we know from history that these two events, uh, that these two items were taken. And the Arch of Titus, which is what we're about to look at, displays both the table of showbread and the menorah. Now, this is the Arch of Titus. It was built uh, in approximately in AD 81, is when it was built. And on the inside of the archway here, on the inside, if you go into the inside, well, on the top up here, it has this inscription, uh, which in, from the Latin, it reads, The Senate and people of Rome, 
and they referred to him as a divine person. They said, to the divine Titus, Vespas Vespasianus Augustus, son of the divine Vespasian, uh, and that was the title that read at the top of the arch there. So it was dedicated to Titus, and that's why it's called the Arch of Titus there. But when you go to the inside here, and I know it's kind of hard to see, and I'll show you a close-up here in just a minute, but you actually have two items. You have the menorah right here, and you have the table of showbread right here. And it shows them being carried back by Roman soldiers through the city. And these items, and here's a close-up picture of it, with the, art, with the menorah here, and this picture here is a reconstruction. It's a little clearer to see that it's a reconstruction uh, of what it would have looked like. And, and again, when we saw that first picture of the menorah, remember the stair step base? Well, that's where they get that from. It's from this arch of Titus here. And see, notice the construction here and how it looks. Uh, this construction, again, from, 81, from AD 81, uh, from when Titus took these two items out of the temple. And again, this being the menorah, or the lampstand. And notice if it's, if it's true to dimension. Notice how tall these men are. I mean, let's, let's say this guy's, you know, let's say he's five and a half feet tall. Well, this thing here isn't even as tall as he is if you look at the overall height of the man. Uh, the menorah here, or the lampstand, would have been, what, about four feet in height. I mean, if you're going to do it, if you're going to do a comparison. Of course, these things often were not to scale, so, so you can't be, be absolutely certain from a picture like this. And then this over here would have been the table of showbread, and uh, maybe a, a cup up here. And these would have been uh, the Roman uh, 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 standards that they would have carried with them. But again, we have these items from history that give us a, a, a picture uh, that comes down to us, and it shows the historical reference points that we can look at these things. And so again, when we look at the table, you know, again, it would have been a fairly small table. And the menorah, again, when we look at it, we see this stair-step platform and the way that they designed it. You can see where it fits very much the design as it was set forth in the Arch of Titus. And so when they design these things, you know, some of the stuff you look at, you say, well, I can see where they get, you know, the, the, the uh, lampstands coming out and the... the, the or the arms coming out the way it's designed in Scripture, but then there's other elements that you don't find, and they get that more from historical reference points than they do from the Scripture. So, anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. Let's go ahead and jump into the uh, text this morning and get started with uh, Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 through 30. And again, this is a short section. This is going to finish out our chapter 25 today. And this is going to look at these two items that we just looked at here, both the table of showbread as well as the lampstand. Now Exodus 25, 23 says, You shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long. And remember a cubit was, was about how long? About, about 18 inches. Yeah, I mean approximately. We don't know. It was about the, the length from, the, uh, from a man's elbow to the tip of his middle finger. What's the problem with that? Well, some people's arms are longer than others, right? So you, so you don't know. So it's about 18 inches. So it says, You shall make a table of acacia wood two cubits long and one cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. So this would have been about 36 inches long. Uh, so about three feet by about um, uh, one cubit wide, about 18 inches, and one and a half cubits high. Uh, so again, we're not, we're not talking about a very big table here. We're talking about a small table, as it were. And then he says, And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a gold border around it. And you shall make for it a rim of a bandwidth around it. And again, that rim, and I know you can't see here, but it's this rim that goes around the edge, which again would have not made it just a flat table, but it would have had that lip on it. So he says, you shall make for it a rim of a handbreadth around it, and you shall make a gold border for the rim. And this would be, again, to keep items from sliding off the top. Verse 26, you shall make four gold rings for it, and put rings on the four corners, which are on its four feet. And you shall be close, the ring shall be close to the rim as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with, with gold. So that, with the so that with them the table may be carried. 
You shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls with which to drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the bread of the presence on the table uh, on the table before me at all times. Now the bread was actually made on a weekly basis. Go with me over to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 24. And let's let's look at the reference points for these. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 through 9, gives us uh, the command regarding the, the baking of these bread items. Leviticus 24, verse 5 says, Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. So we know that there were going to be twelve cakes uh, bread that would have been placed on top. Um, and make twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to each row. So there so there be six on each. Uh, on the pure gold table before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense uh, on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath, and here's the weekly, verse 8. Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and his sons... And they shall eat it. So they were. So the priests were to eat it. And, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire, his portion forever. So, so again, this bread was made on a weekly basis and brought in and, and put on the table and then consumed uh, at the end of the week. Now here I have a quote by Dr. Alan P. Ross. He says, The table of bread was to be a standing acknowledgment that the Lord was the daily giver of bread. It was to show that he was the provider, in effect. Dr. Ross goes on, he says, it was called the presence bread because, because it was bread set out in his presence. And the theology of this simple bread was God provides. That was the theology of it. The practice was that the people must provide for constant thanksgiving to God. So it was an expression of thanksgiving on their part. So if the ark spoke of communion through propitiation, which is what we talked about last week, remember that the ark spoke of propitiation when the priest once a year went into the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled blood on top of what? On top of the mercy seat. And the mercy there being uh, kafar, being the seat of atonement, the mercy seat, the propitiation. And so he says, so if the ark uh, spoke of communion through propitiation, the table speaks of dedicatory gratitude. So again, we see the value, uh, the symbolic value of the table here. Now moving on to the lampstand, he then says in verse 31, he says, then you shall make a lampstand. And the word lampstand here translates the Hebrew word menorah. So when you see that, uh, again, that's where that word menorah comes from. It just simply means a lampstand. And again, going back to our picture here, and I know it's not very good, but, but we've seen the pictures of the menorah. He says, Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. So this was to be a very ornate piece, very decorative, very beautiful. Verse 32, Six branches shall go out from its side, three branches of the lampstand from its one side and three branches of the lampstand from its other side. So again, we see here, according to the picture, the way the branches go out. Verse 33, three cups shall be shaped like <coughs> almond blossoms in the one branch, a bulb and a flower. And three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bulb and a, and a flower. So for six branches going out from the lampstand, verse 34. And in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs, and its flowers. It says in verse 35, A bulb shall be under the first pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it, for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. What he's describing is the way that they come out in succession underneath one another. That's what he's describing there. Uh, verse 36, their bulbs and their branches shall be of one piece with it. All of it shall be one piece of hammered work of pure gold. 
Then you shall make its lamps, seven in number, and they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it. So we see the functional aspect that the lampstand was to provide light inside the tabernacle. Because remember, the tabernacle was a covered place. And naturally, it would have been dark in there. So when the priests go inside, they go inside, they've got to do their work. Right? They have to have some way to see, so this uh, lampstand was to provide sufficient light uh, for inside the tabernacle. Now, uh, let me look at a few passages here. There's a few passages that talk about uh, this. Verse 37 again, Then you shall make its lampstand seven number, uh, and they shall mount its lampstand so as to shed its light on the space in front of it. And this was to be done by the priests. Now go with me over to Exodus chapter 27. Exodus chapter 27. verses 20 and 21, and we'll look at a few verses that talk about this, because again, this was something that was to be done by the priests morning and night, morning and night. Exodus 27, 20 says, You shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil of beaten olives. So they were to use olive oil uh, for the light to make, to make a lamp burn continually. So this thing was to burn continually. Verse 21, in the tent of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. Uh, moving over to Exodus 30, Exodus 30, verses 7 and 8. So Aaron and his sons uh, were to keep this thing fueled with the olive oil to be burned regularly. And then Exodus verses 30, verse 7 and 8, it says, Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamp. So it's his maintenance duty that when he comes in, he's to trim the lamp. And when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, so notice he's to do it every morning, and then he's to do it at twilight when the sun sets. Every evening he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. So when he comes to burn the incense in the morning and in the evening, he's to, at that time, maintain the menorah. He's to maintain the lamp by trimming it. Now going over to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, verses 5... Or not Leviticus. Yeah, Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 4. Sorry, I jumped up to the top of the page. Eyes ever do that? You jump from one part of the page to another? Or am I just alone in there? Okay, well, some of you are smiling. I'll assume you do that too. Okay. Leviticus 24 1. Leviticus 24 1. Okay. Uh, here it says uh, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they may bring to you clear oil from beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. So, again, the the ongoing burning of it. Outside the veil of testimony in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. Again, he shall keep the lamps in order on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. So again, it just demonstrates who was to be in charge of the lampstand uh, as far as the maintenance of it, as far as the, uh, the trimming of it, as far as the con making sure that it was continually burning, was the function of the high priest and the other priests that served with him. Verse 38, going back to our uh, scripture here, it says, "...its snuffers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made from a talent of gold." Now, a talent is a number we're not exactly certain of. It's a number that could range anywhere from 70 to about 90 pounds... The consensus seems to be about 75, uh, so we'll go with that. It shall be made from a talent of pure gold. So it was to be very solid uh, gold here. Uh, verse 40 says, See that you make them after the pattern for them, which was shown to you on the mountain. So again, Moses is still here. He's up on the mountain. He's still getting this instruction. This is all being written down. What we're going to see later as we move into the book of Exodus is the actual construction, is the obedience carried out and the making of these items. Quoting Dr. Ross again, he says, uh, and this would be regarding the lampstand, he said, clearly the point here is to provide light in the tent for access to the Lord. Uh, but the way that this was constructed signified far more, far more than a light bearer. 
God wanted his worshipers to provide light for the lamp, and this would be olive oil, trimming the wicks, etc., to ensure the light continues. But it is God who places the lampstand in their midst. And so between the two, what you have is you have participation. You have God giving instruction, and you have God's people executing it. Okay? And so you have a relationship in which you have uh, uh, participation, in which you have God's people coming and participating uh, in their relationship with the Lord. And God, that is part of a relationship. God calls us to relate to Him. He calls us to participate with Him in this work. And this carries on even into the church age, by the way. Now let's take up some summary points here, and we'll also cover some questions from last week we had as well regarding the bells. Remember the bells? Well, I got some information on that too, so we'll, we'll get that hammered out. I know y'all have lost sleep over it and been waiting to get here this morning, so we'll solve that problem. Uh, taking up some summary points on this particular section, uh, the central idea of the text is that God provided to Moses instructions regarding the building of the table of showbread and the lampstand to be used uh, in the tabernacle. That's basically the central idea of the text, that the Lord continues to provide instruction for these items. By the way, we've already mentioned that it's very important that they follow these instructions very carefully, remember? Remember we, uh, we talked about Nadab and Abihu, remember over in Leviticus 10? And, uh, and how they didn't abide by the instructions, remember? And, uh, and we talked about what happened to them. Point number two, the table of showbread, including its dishes, pans, jars, and bowls used for drink offerings to the Lord, was to have 12 loaves of bread and were to be, there's a word missing there, and were to be replaced each Sabbath day. Now, if you're still open to Leviticus 24, verses 5 through 9, we read that section there. Uh, but that just goes to show that it was to be replaced on a weekly basis. The table of showbread would have pictured fellowship with God, and the priests eating of the bread demonstrated that spiritual fellowship supports spiritual life. The bread that they would have eaten would have sustained them in their ministry work. It would have sustained them in their ministry work of, the, of maintaining the tabernacle. Point number three, the lampstand, including its snuffers and trays, was the most ornate piece of the furniture constructed for the tabernacle and was made of solid gold. The lampstand had six branches going out from its sides and seven lamps, one atop the central stem, that were decoratively fashioned on top to look like almond flowers, buds, and blossoms. So this is the picture that is described here. The lampstand was to burn continually before the Lord and provide the necessary light for the priests to perform their daily duties, which included burning incense every day and night. And those were some of the passages that we looked at there that explained that. Quoting from Warren Wearsby, he says, What was done by the priests in the sanctuary was done for the Lord and before the Lord. It mattered not that the people in the camp were ignorant of what the priests were doing because God saw it and their task was to please Him. I thought that was an interesting point because when the priests went into the tabernacle, those outside couldn't see anything, right? And, and, and what the priests did in there day after day uh, served as representatives of the nation as a whole. Because that's what these priests were doing. They were going in there and performing their spiritual duties as representatives of the nation as a whole. And, and that's what he points out, that, that, that it didn't matter what was going on outside because God saw it. And their task was ultimately to please Him. And really, that's the way we ought to be. Uh, you know, Jesus warned in, in Matthew 6 about practicing your righteousness before men to be seen by them, to be praised by them. Now, there's a point where we do live in the world, and the world at times will see our righteousness, and some will praise it, and some will applaud it, and some will persecute. And Christ has warned us of this, uh, that we'll get both responses. Uh, but the point is, is that when we live righteously, it is unto the Lord that we live our lives. It is Him that we are trying to please. He is our Lord. And point number four, just to give us some... Uh, some context for us in the New Testament, looking at the menorah and the table of showbread. In the New Testament, Christ is referred to as the bread of life who provides nourishment. 
And also he is referred to as the light of the world who illumines those who walk in darkness. It's interesting that both of those uh, references or both of those pictures are given of Christ. That he is both the bread of life and that he is both the light of the world. Now in the church age, and this would be the age in which we live, right? In the church age, Christ has made the church to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, according to Revelation 1.6. So we are a kingdom of priests. And he refers to individual churches as golden lampstands who are to be a light to the world. Now go with me over to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. I, this is very interesting to me. And I remember years ago working through the book of Revelation. And we talked through it here uh, about a year and a half ago during one of our home Bible studies. But we came to this section. And by the way, when you look at the Hebrew word menorah, if you look at it in the, uh, he, in, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament came about uh, circa 250 B.C., uh, the word that was uh, substituted in the Greek is the Greek word lupnia. Lupnia. And that's the same word that is used here in Revelation 1.13. Now John in Revelation 1 has this vision of Christ. And uh, the vision is given, ultimately it's written down, and it's given to the seven churches, right? That are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. And John in Revelation 1.12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And who are the lampstands? What are the lampstands? The seven churches. That's what they are. And then he says in verse 13, And in the middle of the lampstands, Kaimesos to Lugnia. In the middle of the lampstands. Lugnia, there's our word there. I saw one like a son of man. And who is that son of man? That's Christ. That is the son of God. And where is he standing? In the middle of the lampstands. He is standing amongst the churches. That's where he's standing, amongst the churches. And every church ought to realize that Christ is standing amongst them. Every church. And there is hardly a Sunday that goes by that I do not live in the reality of Revelation 1.13. That when we gather together, that I cannot help but think of a church as a lampstand that is to be a light. A light. And that Christ is standing among the lampstands. And that is what we are to be. We are to be a light that reveals God's truth. We are to also be the hands of Christ that show His love. Right? Amen? So it is important to keep in mind that Christians are to be a light. And I was careful to make this point that we are to be a light, not make people see the light, as the latter is something only God can accomplish. And that's an important distinction. Keep that in mind. We are to be a light. But that's different than making people see the light. Because only God can open a person's eyes. Only God can accomplish that task. And so we are to be a light to the world. We are to be that. We are to speak truth. We are to show love. But how people respond to that in the end, is ultimately between them and God. It is a choice they must make as to what they do with the truth that they hear and the love that they see. And of course, we know, we know what they did with Christ. Go with me over to John 3. And we know that many loved Christ. Many came to Him. The majority did not. Christ at another point in the Gospel of Matthew made it clear that narrow is the path 
that leads to life, and few are they who find it. And broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many are they who find it. But Christ is the narrow way. Now in John 3.16 he says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish. Verse 17, And God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's good news. And he who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. Who is that light? That is Christ. And when Christ spoke, He could not have spoken more perfectly than when He spoke, to whom He spoke, in the context in which He spoke. His words could not have been more perfectly stated than when He said it, to whom He said it, in the context in which He said it. And yet, and yet, perfect light did not guarantee a positive response. Perfect light did not guarantee a positive response because what happened to many? What happened? Many turned away. And if we were to be as perfect a light as Christ Himself, we could expect no better response than what He Himself received. And that is that there would be some who would respond positively and many who would not. But our in the final analysis, though we may be grieved by the responses we get, and my heart is, my heart is, I am often very sad by those who turn away from the gospel and those who turn away from the, from, from, from the gospel of Christ because I know what the final analysis of their life is. I know what that is. And yet, I am helpless because there's nothing more that I can do. All I can do is be that light. And he says in verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. And so we are to be a light. But that's different than making people see the light. We pray for that. We hope for that. Our heart breaks for that and mourns for that. But at the end of the day, people's individual volition will be exercised, for better or for worse. They are free individuals. 